Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, a look at the two main theoretical approaches and associated methodologies for understanding team coordination in sports. Shared knowledge slash mental models built on information processing theory versus shared affordances built on ecological dynamics theory. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at the two opposing views of team coordination, shared mental models versus shared affordances. The problem we are addressing here is, how do teammates get on the same page? That is, how do they coordinate their actions to produce effective outcomes, like running an offensive play in football or playing a zone defense in basketball? Another term you will often hear associated with this is team cognition, which includes both coordination and communication. Traditionally, this problem has been studied using two very different theoretical approaches. The shared knowledge or shared mental model approach argues that team coordination is based on shared information players have stored in memory. For example, all of the players on a basketball team have stored a set of rules about what to do when the other team turns the ball over. The alternative view is that team coordination is not based on knowledge stored in memory, but rather hinges on teammates picking up the same affordances at the same time. So, for example, when a gap opens between two defenders in rugby, creating an affordance for making a run, both the ball carrier and the receiver pick up this and coordinate their movements to achieve it. As we will see, corresponding to these two theoretical approaches, there have been very different methodologies used to study team coordination. So let's dive in a bit deeper. Let's first look at the approach that has been around the longest, shared knowledge and shared mental models. Again, as I've done in the past episodes, I want to harp a bit on definitions here. Knowledge here refers to pieces of often unrelated information. My phone number, my birth date, and my middle name are all pieces of knowledge. There are also pieces of knowledge that are shared with members of my family, as we all have them stored in our memories. A mental model is an internal representation of a system. So, it contains several pieces of knowledge, but with the important difference being that it also includes information about how they are related and interact with each other. The classical example of a mental model is a cognitive map. Each of us have stored in our memory an internal representation of the area we live in, where places are relative to each other, roughly how far apart they are, etc. So, we have an internal representation of a city. Note, of course, that this mental model could have errors in it, and some people will have more detailed and elaborate mental models than others. And of course, these mental models can also be shared. That is what allows you to easily tell your neighbor how to get to the new brew pub that just opened up. You both share a cognitive map of your area. Okay, let's get back to how this relates to team coordination. At face value, shared knowledge is fairly self-explanatory. It is a collective knowledge shared by a team of individuals. The shared information is often stable. For example, most ice hockey players know what icing the puck is during a hockey game. Shared knowledge can often achieve a greater complexity than just the rules of a sports game. For example, a basketball team could know prior to a game that a player on the opposition is poor at dribbling with their left hand, which could affect the team's defensive preparation in dealing with that player and the team. Under the umbrella of shared knowledge is the idea of a mental model. When individual mental models are shared amongst team members, a shared mental model may develop. Shared mental models often provide teammates with the ability to coordinate thoughts and actions without necessarily explicitly communicating in dynamic situations. Over the years, shared mental models have become a common way to articulate how teammates coordinate with each other, making them a popular method for studying team cognition. It has been suggested that team members must share mental models that describe when and how they must interact with each other in order to accomplish the task. In research, shared mental models are typically observed at the individual level and then aggregated to the team level. Let's look at a couple examples of research to make this a bit clearer. In 2012, Burbison and colleagues investigated shared knowledge in basketball. Five players from the under-18 French national team were filmed during the course of play, and they were individually interviewed afterwards. 
The interviews involve the experimenter and the player watching the film of the game together, with the player being asked to comment on the activity going on, what they were doing, feeling, thinking, and perceiving. The main question of interest was to what degree the concerns of each teammate corresponded to each other in a given instant. An example of a concern would be, player A was concerned with finding the best position on the court to receive the ball. What was found in this study? Using these concerns, the authors categorized sharedness into three forms. One, moments of non-sharedness, which occurred during 1% of all activities. Two, partial sharedness, which accounted for 87% of instances. And three, complete sharedness, which represented 12% of the total amount of shared events. So you can see overall, there's a lot of shared knowledge about the concerns going on during the game. Another recent example is a study by Giske and colleagues published in 2015. The goal of this study was to determine to what extent shared mental models exist in expert ice hockey and handball players. In particular, they were concerned with whether or not teams had established collective priorities, such as their general attack pattern. A secondary goal was to determine to what extent players engaged in practice activities to develop the shared knowledge. A total of 231 male senior players from the Norwegian elite leagues of ice hockey and handball took part in the study. Players were asked to make Likert scale ratings in response to questions like, in my team there's an established attack movement which is based on a common attack pattern. I know what other players do when such common attack patterns are implemented. And in pre-match meetings, the coach talks about the opponent's strengths and weaknesses. What was found? For most of these questions, there were high positive ratings, suggesting that athletes perceived that there was a shared mental model on their team and their pre-game preparations and practice were dedicated to the shared mental model. So, from these examples, hopefully you can see the basic approach to studying team coordination from the shared knowledge perspective. It basically involves using knowledge elicitation methods, for example ratings or interviews, for individual players, and then combining this at the team level to access the level of sharedness. Another point to emphasize is that teamwork is studied retrospectively and out of context. Remember, this is not an issue for the shared knowledge approach because team coordination lies in the memory stores in the brain and thus can be accessed offline. For me, there are a couple clear limitations of this approach. First, it doesn't really explain how players actually achieve coordinated actions online. Do they really have stored plays or rules for every possible outcome on the field? Would accessing these really be fast enough to see the kind of fast actions we see in sport? How does this support novel or creative plays? Is it really going to be adaptable to the ever-changing conditions we have in a lot of sports? Here we seem to be getting into some of the same issues that have been raised about motor programs which I discussed back in the series on Bernstein. I should say, there are knowledge models that do attempt to address these issues, in particular Gary Klein's recognition prime decision-making model that I will be discussing in a future episode. A second issue I have with the studies like I just described is that the fact that you can show players have knowledge about things like attack formations, and that some of this might be shared amongst players, does not necessarily mean that that is what is being used to control the actions online in the moment. We develop metacognitive type knowledge about almost everything we do. Just ask any athlete what they think they're doing while they run, swing, kick, etc. But this does not mean that this knowledge is actually being used to control movement in the moment. It could just be artifactual. This issue is similar to the one I talked about back in episode 113. Just because we can predict what might happen when we move does not mean we use predictive control. Let's now turn to the alternative theoretical approach to team coordination, which attempts to address some of the issues I just raised. An alternative theory to the shared knowledge point of view is one that arises from the ecological dynamics approach to skilled motor action. Ecological enthusiasts argue that the shared knowledge model may be relevant to teammates before a competition, but is incapable of adapting to the unstable arena that is a sporting event. A staple of the ecological approach is that harmonized actions by sports teams are due to generation of shared affordances between team members, due to a collaborative processes, which occur online in real time. Instead of team cognition being based on shared knowledge in the form of stored representation and schema, coordination amongst teammates is achieved through shared attunement to perceptual information. 
This distinction between shared knowledge and shared attunement can be understood by considering an example from soccer. Imagine a midfielder lobs a pass over the defenders at the exact moment a striker teammate breaks for goal. How did both players come to execute such a coordinated action without any explicit communication beforehand? In the shared knowledge account, this type of coordination occurs because both players have stored a schema for the lob pass play, and both decided to execute this action after processing the available perceptual cues, for example the relative positions of the players. This may also involve an intermediate step of identifying the defensive strategy that is being played by the opponent. For example, a 3-4-3 flat formation in soccer or a zone defense in basketball. In this account, the perceptual cues are non-informative in and of themselves. Instead, they've come to be associated with this particular action or play through extensive practice and or coach's instruction. For example, being told that when the defenders do X, you should do Y. Thus, the keys to team coordination in this account are that 1. Both players have stored similar set of schema. In other words, they learn the same set of plays. And 2. These schema are associated with the same perceptual cues for each player. The primary distinction with the shared attunement account comes at the level of player's perception. Instead of detecting non-informative perceptual cues that must be processed and associated with stored knowledge so that a decision about what action to execute can be reached, the ecological approach argues that perception involves the pickup of information sources which directly specify opportunities for actions. For example, in the soccer example described above, the two teammates might detect a higher order perceptual variable we might call tau diff, which gives the difference between the time of arrival of the defender at the past landing point and the time of arrival of the striker at the same location. Tau diff is optically specified by the ratio of the angular gap between each player and the landing location and the rate of change of these gaps. This variable is informative because it directly specifies whether or not there is an opportunity for a lob pass, tau diff is greater than zero, or there is not an opportunity, tau diff is less than zero. Coordination between players occurs in this case because both players are attuned to tau diff and thus would simultaneously detect when the environment affords the opportunity for a lob pass. On the surface, since the perceptual information needed for this action is available to anyone with a functional visual system and does not require one to learn the schema for the quote-unquote lob pass play, it might be assumed that practice is less important for the development of team coordination in the ecological approach. However, it has been shown that practice is often required for actors to become attuned to such higher order variables, as novice performers often rely on simpler and less effective information sources, non-specifying ones, for example, like the distance of players from the ball. Furthermore, these information sources must be scaled by the action capabilities of both performers, which again would presumably occur through practice. For example, the tau diff value that affords lob passing also depends on the maximum running speed that can be achieved by the striker and the maximum velocity at which the midfielder can accurately pass the ball. In summary, the keys to team cognition in the ecological account are 1. That both players are tuned to the same information sources and 2. Both players' perceptions are effectively calibrated for the action capabilities of their teammates. Another important difference between these two approaches is the point in time in which team coordination is achieved. On the one hand, in the shared knowledge approach, coordination is achieved when teammates have developed the same set of schema, knowledge, and same set of cue response contingencies. Thus, team cognition in sports can be assessed offline, since it's not actually dependent on the events of a particular game or match, and can be studied independently, since it does not depend on the interaction between teammates. On the other hand, in the shared attunement approach, Coordination can only be understood within the context of the performance itself, since the information sources only exist when the perception and action cycle is intact, and when the teammates interact, since these information sources are defined relative to the action capabilities of the different performers. Thus, in the ecological approach, team coordination research must be coupled, online, and interactive. Previous ecological research on team cognition has utilized both micro and macro level methodologies. 
At a micro level, researchers have begun to identify candidate perceptual information sources that could be used for coordinated behavior. Again, because the information sources only exist online, research in this area has involved the analysis of either real, via video, or simulated gameplay. For example, Duarte Arugio and colleagues have examined player dyads in basketball and defined a collective variable based on the distance of each player from the basketball. They further show that this variable alternates between stable states and abrupt changes, which can be related to players' decision to attack the basket. Similar to the soccer example I described a few moments ago, another approach has been to analyze the use of temporal gap information, similar to the tau diff I've been talking about. For example, Correa and colleagues showed, using a rugby simulation, that a rugby ball carrier's decision to run, pass short, or pass long is based on the relative temporal gaps between players. At a macro level, some recent studies have sought to understand the nature of the coordinated behaviors that emerge from the interaction between teammates. This has involved GPS data collected from multiple teammates during actual gameplay to calculate a variety of dynamical group-based metrics, including centroids, team dispersion, synchrony, and team communication networks. This line of research has produced several interesting findings, including that changes in centroid and surface area metrics indicating a loss of stability, frequently occur just before an assisted pass is made, and that group metrics are influenced by the number of players and the size of the playing field. It will be important for this relatively new line of research to further relate these macro-level measures of coordination to performance measures, like goals and wins, to understand the relationship between the micro-level perceptual information and macro-level outcomes. For more information about the micro and macro level research into team coordination, I recommend you check out my interview with Duarte Arugio back in episode 18D. A final example of a methodology that has been used to study this type of interactive team coordination is one that I actually developed with a group of my colleagues at ASU. It involves having a group of teammates perform an inclusion-based decision-making task using a video of the same play shot from different angles. We use this to study team coordination in baseball infielders. For more information, see the link to the paper in the show notes and or listen to episode 63 where I talked about this paper in detail. As was the case with the shared knowledge approach, these methods used in the shared affordance approach do have their limitations, of course. When we look at macro-level behavior, it doesn't really tell us about the underlying perceptual and cognitive processes. And when we look at things at a micro-level, there's no way to incorporate things like attack formation, tendencies of an opponent, etc. But I'll get to that in a second. So, to sum up, we've seen here that there are two very distinctly different ways to think about team coordination in sports. For me, I find the ecological shared affordance approach, where team coordination is studied interactively and in context, to just be an intuitively better way to understand how teamwork works, as opposed to assessing knowledge passively, individually, and offline. Because it relies on detailed perceptual information, I think the shared affordance approach also provides a richer and more parsimonious account of how the actions of teammates are actually controlled. However, I do recognize that there has to be a role for knowledge that athletes have about the rules, the formations, and the plays they practice. But I think there may be a better way to incorporate this than having to bring in full-blown internal representations and mental models into play. For example, I think many of these things could be understood in terms of shared constraints. In sports, the rules of the game, which presumably all players on a team know, serve as shared global constraints which determine the boundaries of the affordance landscape. Particular plays and formations that a specific team uses, on the other hand, could be thought of kind of as shared local constraints that create attractors in the affordance landscape, but it's still possible to find other solutions, allowing for moments of complete novelty and creativity. When teams practice certain plays, the change in team coordination can also be understood in terms of shared education of attention. For example, a team that regularly practices the lob pass play I was describing earlier would have players which have had their attention educated to the perceptual variable tau diff while teams that don't use this play will presumably be attuned to other perceptual information sources. Anyways, I think this ecological, shared affordance, and possibly shared constraint approach is an exciting new area, and I look forward to more research coming in the future. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu, 
or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWakes. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and transcripts, please head over to Patreon.com forward slash PerceptionAction. This month's bonus episode looks at how we might enhance skill by augmenting errors. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Quit.